Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. In Denmark, we used to say that the later in the program, the lighter the beer will become. So <laughs> uh, I'm impressed by the fact that so many of you are still here. I've been at many conferences and I know how it is by the end, but it's also a way in a way a little more familiar uh, when, uh, than the more uh, formal in, uh, start of the program. Uh, since I only have ten, ten minutes, so I limit myself to 20 years back in time. Uh, just like our democracy here in the Nordic countries started uh, with the Thingvallir parliament in Iceland, uh, in sometime in the middle of the 90s, uh, we got some money from a Nordic foundation for uh, research cooperation. Uh, and um, the young gentleman introducing me uh, also was involved. He was hired at the same time at Forest and Landscape in Denmark, and we arranged a Nordic workshop, actually, about urban forestry. That workshop then uh, became the start of preparing a cost action. Cost is a program where you get a lot of money for traveling around and having nice meetings, but you don't get any money for, for doing any research. Uh, but it's excellent for networking and uh, to map where you find good people. And then two other young colleagues joined, so to say, the, the team, and that was Stefan Paulite, uh, and that was Cecil Koninen, like, in that group. And that was actually one out of three different research networks or research, European research teams that amalgamated into an application to the sixth European framework program. And uh, then we uh, got a project called Plurel about peri-urban land use relationships. And actually it was quite a kind of a broad study on documenting urbanization processes and the consequences of urbanization processes on European level. And it was also supplemented with a number of case studies. And as a conclusion or an outcome of the case studies, actually we, we formulated or identified a number of principles that should be important for sustainable urban development. And these principles, I don't go into them, you know them fairly well, I suppose. The first one was a better coordination between transport, land use and open space planning. The second was the importance of urban containment and densification. The third one was about preservation of the blue and green infrastructure. The fourth, about protection of agricultural land and local food production. And the fifth, good governance and integrated policy approaches. Um, and then, uh, so that was, so to say, the result of that job. Then it comes to the next stage, which was actually green surge in this row of different research activities. And I actually delivered the draft or the principles for the call text to Brussels for green search before leaving Copenhagen. <laughs> and uh, that ended up and through uh, to a uh, new, so to say, research activity, building on plural as I see it in many cases. And when I go back to this, I can see directly 
looking at the content and what you have been doing here for four years or whatever it is, that you really have advanced the knowledge, especially about the blue and green infrastructure. And that term, as well as, of course, the preservation of or, or this with integrating agriculture in uh, urban areas in different ways. And as well as a lot of focus on governance. And I must say I'm really impressed by the improvement that has been taking place after Plural in these cases, because it's, it has really advanced when I look at the uh, deliverables or the products, and uh, not least, which is now, so to say, compiled it in this handbook. And uh, uh, we can discuss more about that, actually, at the scientific advisory group meeting tomorrow, a little uh, about what is new and so on, but it's really clear that things have advanced, and that's how it should be over the years. Okay, then, now I did what I shouldn't. Okay, um, a little just what is, uh, as Thomas say, nowadays I'm actually involved, or I'm director for a Nordic I would say a social science research institute. We are a small, a Nordic version of OECD primarily in that way. So, but we also do some studies actually that has a relation to the field here. And I heard that, um, I'd, I just realized that the first project on this list, uh, there is a connection with the gr growing green uh, team, because you mentioned Technalia, and Technalia is lead partner of the Espon Greta project. Espon is another European program for rather uh, uh, for research, though it only has about tenth of the size of the, the budgets. <laughs> but they ask for more or less the same. That's the problem with the Espon program. But okay, we are in, Norregio is involved in one, which is, you can say, a mini green search, I would say. Uh, secondly, when it comes to urban agriculture, that is actually a theme in a Horizon project where Norregio is partner, which is about exporting these uh, urban agricultural movements to China. And the last one, which is the most important from a political point of view, is that we uh, have produced a kind of a white paper for what is called a Prime Minister's Initiative on Nordic Solutions to Global Challenges with the topic uh, Nordic Sustainable Cities. And in that we have actually we have defined nine different uh, qualities in Nordic cities where competence might be able to... The, the ambition is to export this knowledge to primarily China, India and North America. Let's see how it goes, but that is actually... And I would mention just two of these two principles which are also relevant, very much relevant in the... Uh, in green surge, and that is uh, the, the way of putting man or people in the center, which is a very uh, important part also when it comes to, to um, the activities here. And the other is, of course, about the greenery, and we call it the compact green city. <coughs> Uh, I was also asked to have some reflections on uh, the different European programs. And um, I would say what has happened is that from in the fifth framework program, there were, I think, five urban projects. All were 
carried out more or less like case studies. So it was very much focused on the practical aspect. And when the evaluators looked at what come, came out of these projects, they said that this is not research, actually. It's, a lot, it's interesting cases and a lot of actions, but what can we learn from it? So when the sixth framework program came, then the Commission said, now we want modeling projects, and Plurel is one of them. And actually, in the last in a row of three or four projects that were focusing a lot on scientific modeling. Very theoretical, you can say, in, or, or developing methods. Now, so to say, with Horizon and, and with Horizon, as, then came FP7, where you have this with the uh, urban landscape laboratories as a kind of more action-oriented moment in the projects again. And now we see the next generation where, so to say, the responsibility for the project is taken over by the local authorities or authorities again. So you have had a wave, actually, <laughs> from uh, this with very implemented and very uh, practically oriented projects going on over this wave, over this uh, period of more theoretically and model oriented projects. And now we are back on that. And I would say that there are pros and cons in both ways. If I would say, should say, Ed, when I talk to people from the commission, I used to say, can't you do two things? Do you have to use one extreme or the other? If you look at actually this, I mean there is clearly an advantage when it comes to the commitment of the local authorities or the practitioners within the model that is in your project, for example, because that is often the problem when you have case studies. There is so much going on, so you have to compete and so on. I can also recognize what you said in Bari about this problem when there comes a new political leadership, actually. We experience that we have a smaller project uh, where, with, where Kujalech Kommune in uh, southern Greenland is partner. And there they got the new mayor. <laughs> and suddenly, and we have a Nor Norwegian municipality where you have uh, suddenly the person who is the contact retires and the person he hired to do the job finds a new job <laughs> and the other people don't. So, I mean, the commitment in these are often pending on few persons and when you have a big organization like this, then, of course, you get this. You can be sure that the city is committed to do the job. And of course, the, the political relevance and the uh, implementation becomes quite clear. That is no doubt when you have a practitioner, so to say, in a lead role, or at least as partners in the project. On the negative side, you can say that the scientific hate the bar is lower. That is the consequence that we will see. Uh, there will not be the same uh, output when it comes to scientific results. It is also less generic. That's what they discovered with the fifth program, when you should scale it up and say this is general rules. And what I want to finish with, which is maybe the most important thing is that the research also might become less critical because the politicians, and now I'm talking of politicians and not, uh, not uh, people, officials dealing with the project, but the politicians often see the pro these projects as branding. And then when 
the researchers come in and say, maybe there is someone who can do this better or there is an alternative way. I have experienced in these situations that then the politicians say, no, you should. <laughs> we want to, to, own, to, to be shown as the good guy here and not in a bad way. So that is something that probably will show up in projects with an organization where you have actually a political leadership in the top. That's all I had to say about research on green infrastructure. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Yeah.